Good afternoon, everybody. I'm so very pleased to welcome you all back for our final keynote presentation this afternoon. This, so this session is where we take stock. Wendy Steele, who I'm going to introduce in a moment, is going to throw us some challenges as to how we might progress some of the ideas and perspectives and strategies that we've talked about over the past two days. And after that, in a kind of UP tradition, I'm going to invite the chair of IUPIA, Professor Don Miller, to respond both to Wendy and also to share with us some of his own perspectives over the past two days. And then he's going to invite Ed Blakely and Rod Simpson to join in the conversation along with Wendy and the rest of you for a couple of, um, for a five or ten minutes of final summative discussion before we then move to a very exciting announcement about where UPE 11 will be held. So, I was delighted when Wendy Steele accepted our invitation to deliver the final keynote presentation for UPE 10. We all know what a tough gig doing the last speech is, just to drive it home. But anyone who's ever heard Wendy knows she's always got something worth listening to. Wendy's a research fellow with a very well respected, I have to say, urban research program at Griffith University in Queensland. You've probably heard from way too many people from Griffith over the last two days as well. But Wendy's recently been awarded a very prestigious research fellowship by the Australian Research Council and much of her work focuses on the twin dimensions of climate justice and security, not to mention the implications for planners. So welcome, Wendy. Wow, quite a welcome. <laughs> um, look, uh, good afternoon, everyone, and sincere thanks to Nicole and to Ed and all the organisers for what's been a really terrific symposium, really interesting and thought-provoking uh, and engagement of advocacy, policy and the Academy, which is great to see. Uh, I feel really honoured uh, to be here. Uh, everyone in this room has a story that they could share, and so this, this is just one story that I have the privilege of sharing with you uh, this afternoon. So over the last two days, we've had a range of different uh, perspectives and stories. We've had a number of keynote speakers, and you know these are people that are experts in their field, and they've talked uh, in great detail to the fine grain of the work that they do, and I'm not going to try and replicate um, that kind of expertise, uh, those sort of years of experience in any way uh, at all. Uh, instead, what I'd like to do is take the chance to focus on the importance uh, of a, a kind of bigger picture, if you like, of place and context and how that plays out in understanding future challenges with particular reference to the Australian story. So my thesis, if you like, is that next city, which is the theme of this session, lies at the nexus between past, present and future and must be understood in context. So Next City is not some aspatial science fiction fantasy offering sanitised utopic or dystopic future visions as homogenous as they are predictable. But rather the challenge for Next City in a climate and energy constrained future is a rearticulation and a recognition of the trajectory of settlement history and the specificities of democratic governance planning cultures as they play out in context. So uh, there are no quick fixes, I feel, for the complex assemblages that are our cities, even from the poster children uh, of Portland, uh, Amsterdam and Vancouver that we often hear about, because the, these are not ways that we can retrofit our cities. The flow and exchange of ideas, such as symposiums like this, are important. But ultimately, these ideas must be absorbed back into the grounded spaces, places and communities and filtered through the space-specific democratic processes that underpin progressive societies. So when we look at cities, we look into a mirror. So our cities are us and we are them in all of their complexity, their creativity and their contradiction. They're the single greatest expression of us as a species, our ambitions, our achievements, our ingenuity, our compassion and of course our hubris. We do not, we do not always like what we see. And as Walter Benjamin evocatively describes, I mean, one might conjure up the angel of history who, and he wrote, a storm is blowing from paradise. It's got caught in its wings and with such violence that the angel can no longer close them. 
the storm irresistibly propels him into the future to which his back is turned and while the pile of debris before him grows sky high. And this storm is what we call progress. So cities, as both outcome and agent of visceral human progress, act as the discursive sites for our contradictions and collective anxieties. They are places of decay, moral turpitude and social disorganisation. For Beauregard, the problems of cities like some ecological night of the living dead always return to haunt us. Abani describes the city as half slum, half paradise, and wonders how they can be so violent, so ugly, and yet so beautiful all at the same time. Mike Davidson's vision of a planet of slums offers us a dystopic image of a 21st century urban world squatting in its own excrement, surrounded by pollution and decay of its own making. And you contrast this with Ed Glazer, who trumpets that on a planet with vast amounts of space, we choose cities. The city has triumphed. And at one level, he has a point. Our cities are now capable of being seen from space. They are the superstructure of the superspecies in the age of the Anthropocene. But as Okomi sanguinely describes, we live in the age of cities. The city is everything to us. It consumes us, and for that reason, we glorify it. But we also fear it. Cities are now home to more than half the world's population, consume nearly three quarters of its natural resources, and are highly vulnerable to the impacts of human-induced climate change. Mike Hume describes climate change in the following ways. He argues that climate change is reminding us in case we had imagined otherwise, that we are intimate co-workers with the non-human in the mutual shaping of our present and future worlds, rather than being the lords of all we see. Climate change is teaching us, in case we had hoped otherwise, that the future is irredeemably precarious and beyond all our efforts of prediction and control, and that climate change is convincing us, and this is his quote, in case we believed otherwise, that our identities and our interpretations of the world can never fully escape our encounters with place and with materiality. So with colleagues, uh, uh, Donna Houston, uh, Jason Byrne and Dinah McCallum, we've been looking at issues of climate justice. And so for us, climate change is about uh, a number of things. Firstly, we see it as being a cultural and environmental crisis where the impacts are being felt most by the most marginalised sectors of our society. Second, uh, and I appreciate I'm just a little bit behind here. Second, where society, economy and nature are all simultaneously, mutually and constantly reconfigured. And finally, that as a result, we must better take into account the complex links between human society and the natural environment, which are currently locked into processes that remain, we argue, hardwired to dry economic, not equitable models of growth. So for Australian cities perched on the coastline with 80% of the population located in the five largest cities, these new climate and energy challenges take on a particular type of poignancy and urgency when planning for the future. Culturally, geographically, spatially specific, our cities have a context. A global context, of course, unbound with investment technology and a footprint that extends far beyond jurisdictional or administrative borders but one grounded in particular politico and eco places, unique historical trajectories, landscapes and politics that must be understood in situ, and this will flow through the rest of my talk. So Pat Troy, who's uh, committed a lot of his life to the advocacy of urban issues and cities in Australia, identified about 10 years ago in this book the key challenges that he felt Australian cities were, were facing at that time. So these included how to find a way to accommodate the diverse and changing urban activities that were happening how to provide and finance for urban services, manage the transition from the inherited form and structure to the new urban space and accommodate new patterns of urban development that were occurring within it. So his plea at the time was not for physical or technological determinism, not, not that avenue as a way forward, but recognition instead of the impact of dynamic economic forces and changing social attitudes, and more recently we might add a much better understanding of climate global change, which shaped development and the, distribu the distribution of well-being amongst the city's population. And a strong call was that we must understand that we are being influenced in almost everything we do by the patterns of earlier eras. And, and I want to cast back to that uh, as we move forward in thinking about next city. I think um, it skipped forward a couple of slides. Thank you. Thanks. Great. Terrific. So look, um, a book by uh, Blaney, and we're, we're not going to get into the immigration controversy that resulted as a result of this. I want to speak more to his uh, thinking about distance as a concept. 
He highlighted that distance and isolation was a characteristic of Australia as the mountains are to Switzerland. A bit like the frontier theory was to the states, distance has really defined Australia in ways that it hasn't in other places. So the distance to other countries, particularly to the United Kingdom, the distance of our vast coastland, and one that moulds and shapes our history. So early Australian towns faced the sea. The wealth and importance of trade was what linked us back to the motherland. As he describes quite evocatively, Australian cities hugged the rim of the continent. They stood like seagulls on the sea cliffs and beaches, as they do today, and that the sea was the line of key communication because water carriage was cheap. Land barrier was also a significant thing within the Australian settlement uh, context. Australia has a spine of low mountains that run parallel to the east coast, uh, which the US does not in the same sense. Um, the watershed of rivers are close by, they're, they're close to the coast. We don't have the kind of canal and big river Mississippi type styles that the US had, so it was very hard to penetrate inward and inland uh, in the ways that were done in other places. Marcus Clark describes that hopeless explorers have named the mountains out of their suffering, Mount Misery, Mount Dreadful, Mount Despair, and he describes that the soul was placed before the frightful grandeur of barren hills and it drinks in their sentiment of defiant ferocity and steeped in bitterness in their efforts to get past these mountains. But no, that's why we were, we were stuck close to the coast for such a long time. Great. So what Blaney describes, I think, quite inappropriately as the Boomerang Coast, and inappropriate because these uh, city settlements were white settlements, uh, and they overlaid an ancient culture that had been there for thousands of years beforehand. So it seems quite disrespectful, I think, to describe the settlement pattern as a boomerang, so, although the shape uh, is, is similar. But the coast uh, that has this uh, sort of banana shape, if you like, is less than a tenth of the country area, and yet eight out of ten of the population back then and even now uh, lived in that area. So in some ways you could argue that the density had addressed the distance, that there was uh, an efficiency in terms of less travelling of goods and supply. And so in those times, because of the, the geographic context, because of the way that it had been settled, the dominant cities were the simplest solutions to the problems of distance. Sydney and Melbourne alternated as the largest cities in the populous colonies, and two out of three Australians lived in these cities in New South Wales and Victoria. I mean, there's much that's been made of the railway gauges in Australia and its uh, geography. But at the end of the day, in Australia, for those that don't know, the different states had different size rail gauges, and so the rails didn't link. You had to get off and get onto different trains, depending on the wealth of the colony. But at the end of the day, it actually didn't matter because Australia didn't have a unified economy. It was so, its economy was based around these significant coastal cities, these capital cities. And so it was really quite a different kind of uh, uh, setup than, than what other countries at the time had. This distance was also reflected politically. In 1901, many of you know, we became a federation and six separate colonies recognised an agreement that it was necessary at times to forge together to come become a commonwealth and, and thus uh, become the nation of Australia. But their relationship had been characterised by intense rivalry over free trade uh, versus protectionism. Um, Queensland and Western Australia were not interested for a long time. New Zealand was invited but declined the offer to join the, uh, the newly formed federation. Um, so the constitution was purposely made to, to fit around these, uh, th these uh, Australian characteristics of the colonies. Uh, the, the state's rights were inalienable from that very start. And, and, and to understand the politics of governing cities now, you have to understand that constitution, constitutional context. And I think that something that's characterised Australia, different to the United States, is that there was, n there was no drama around this. This was a kind of a, a, a mission of expediency. There was no revolution. There, was no, there, was, there were no political fights about this. This wasn't kind of a dramatic, romantic kind of moment. This was something that happened to kind of pull different powerful states together uh, in some areas that, that it assisted them to be more unified. Um, uh, Duffy described the reality is that federation was really boring because no one died. There was a lack of material sacrifice or revolution. I mean, this is the stuff of history, surely. So where are we in Australia? As Cannon articulates, white Australians established themselves at a few convenient ports around the endless coastline. They, re they hurled themselves at the intimidating interior and retired again and again, baffled and defeated back to their starting points. So the population clustered in a couple of cities baffled other expansionist societies. 
In the 1800s, Sir George Parkin described the abnormal aggregation of the population into the capital cities as a most unfortunate element of the progress of the colonies. The concentration of the great mass of people in a few large cities is anything but conducive to public health, morality, or happiness. But the ignorant brutes will not leave the cities. Everywhere, the monster of urbanism is bursting its chains. And this is in the 1800s, so well before Mumford talked about the burst urban container. And yet American sociologist Aidna Weber, and I'm not sure how well known she is, she, uh, he is, uh, came out and said that Australian cities and suburbs in, in fact form the future pattern of the civilized world. Australia is representative, he argued, of the new order of things toward which the modern world is advancing. And he particularly looked at the way that in the early stage of America, only 3% of Americans lived in cities, compared to Australia, more than like 33% uh, in the early foundations of Australia lived in cities, uh, spreading out over bigger areas than London, Paris, or New York. So the claim to fame for Australia is that no other country had, massed, had massed its population into so few centres. And that this was argued was progressive Australian democracy adjusting itself to the requirements of the modern industrial organisation and the division of international and local labour. And while it seems that I might be belabouring the point, I think that you'll see as I show you maps of recent maps that a lot of this has not changed. We still have this kind of unique spatial settlement that has to be understood in context. So by 1971, 85% of Australians were urban dwellers. All cities were grappling with the problem of expansionism. We were a nation of coastal cities. Many Australians have never seen the outback, even though this is what we're so well known for. We stepped out affluently after the Second World War. Now, the construction of cities was seen as central to the dynamic of growth in Australia in the second half uh, of the century. The building and servicing of towns produced a new image and new priorities. Donald Horne calls this the time of hope, a new sophistication. Foreign investment created what he evocatively describes eddies of money. So all of the Australian cities were transformed as activity hummed, land speculators big and small, buying and selling, cranes on the skyline, concrete trucks, building sites patiently turning their concrete wheels. So there may have been a lot of prestige often office space available, but it was obvious, or it seemed to the people at the time, that cities would last forever, as would their development. Sydney architect George Clark, even at that time, uh, looked from Townsville, which is in Queensland, down to Eden, which is uh, down in sort of n southern New South Wales, and saw a linear coastal metropolis, a necklace, as he described it, of cities. So this is taken from the State of Australian Cities uh, report. This is recently, and you'll see that there are some things that are strikingly similar to that uh, banana-type development that our first settlers, uh, we still have you know, really vastly a, a, a large country that's largely uninhabited. We have a few, a few regions, mega-regions of, of urban population that are clustered just as they once were around those state-based power priorities. But of course, these areas have expanded. They're now a mega metro regions. And yet, and we've done a number of, quite a bit of writing about the fact that we have a governance deficit in Australia in which these mega regions have no recognized voice uh, or a ability to articulate the, the uh, mega metro regional wide issues, particularly around infrastructure. Climate change adaptation is another one that we would argue uh, goes into that. And some of the key issues that um, we write about, but I uh, won't go into this in detail now, I wonder if I'm not pointing it at the right way. But, um, but I think it's worth flagging, uh, you know, two, two issues that never seem to go away, for whom the road tolls, where we have issues. You know, the automobility of Australia, uh, our um, seeming obsession with building tunnels uh, that, with tolls, that uh, there's no one uh, example within Australia where that has either uh, come to budget or reduced the kind of issues, you know, traffic congestion or the other issues that uh, it was set up to do. But also, I think, uh, some, a fairly simplistic debate in terms of housing affordability. And uh, even, I mean, just recently, I think a few weeks ago, I did a radio interview on the ABC. And it seems that we're casting it again in terms of density versus you know, sprawl, up or out. And yet, this is really missing the bigger picture. Because while we sort of look at this kind of two-dimensional element, the, 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 the spatial settlement patterns in Australia are happening in every which way. We're looking at cities conjoining together. We're looking at lots of dimensions. And I think a simplistic argument about saying that you know, if we don't extend out into our green space areas, then housing won't be affordable uh, needs to be uh, unpacked with a little more scrutiny. I mean, that's been the agenda for about 20 years now, and we haven't seen more housing affordability, so perhaps we need to come up with a different narrative. 
But I think the key issues here is that it's been really unclear what, what, where are the borders, what, what, what are our cities, and, and at what point do we look at governance structures um, that can deal with it. And, uh, um, and I think that this connects really well with some of the recent work by Neil Brenner. He's a professor at Harvard, uh, and he's sort of been trying to understand how our urban areas are now connecting um, with the hinterland around it. I'm going to just take a bit of time to offer some of what are really provocative ideas that he's offering uh, in terms of where the future of cities are going. And he actually gets rid of the idea of cities as a useful uh, analytical tool. Okay, so what Neil's saying is that the urban can no longer be really understood as a type of settlement space. And in fact, the urban is a worldwide condition within which our current political economic conditions are enmeshed. That the urban versus non-urban is a kind of an ideological projection that it's had its day. That's, that's what he's arguing. That everything now is urban. Not in the sense of the kind of, you know, uh, Death Star, Star Wars style, but the fact that what he's arguing is that our shipping lanes are urban. Antarctica is urban. So uh, our hinterlands are urban. And if we try and have some categories in terms of the urban, the suburban and the regional, that we're actually really missing the point in terms of the connectivities of the way our structures work. And that, you know, his provocation is that the city as an empirical tool uh, has had its day and yet we continue to fetishise this moment. So he talks about, at some length, about this idea of settlement fetishism. And he, he mentions, I'll just briefly, because I think this is quite interesting for us to understand the shifting dynamic of, of what it is that we're dealing with here when we really start to think through what climate change is about. So he, he identifies two moments that work together. Both are important. He's not saying that one should be done away with. One is the moment of concentrated urbanization. This is the moment of implosion. This is the moment of agglomeration, of certainty, of density. This is the moment of cities. But the other one, which he says we've neglected in our thinking, is the one of extended urbanization. This is the area of transformation, of the reorganization of the urban fabric, of the constant churning of the world that we live in. And that the city is but one moment within these other dynamics. And that we need to better understand the transformations of territory, place, and scale. So for him, the 21st century urban has been reconfigured. It's now an explosion of the urban-rural division. It's an explosion of what is city versus non-city, because our footprint in the age of the Anthropocene is so large. It's, it's, it's recognising that we now have urban galaxies, if you like. This is not that concrete has taken over everything. This is re-articulating what we understand to be the human impact on the world in which we're in. It's quite a different kind of concept. This is the churning, the blurring, the re-articulation of urban territory. Uh, he's called this planetary urbanisation, and there's going to be a lot more talk about this in the, in the coming decade. Uh, a massive transformation that cannot be understood with reference to a particular type of settlement uh, type, such as the city. And key spaces of that, he argues, part of what this urban fabric, which is woven through where we live, include things like the transoceanic shipping lanes, highways, railway networks, worldwide communication infrastructures, uh, such as the NBN, which colleagues are, are looking at and how they're disconnected from our, our metro planning strategies, um, alpine and coastal tourist enclaves, nature parks, offshore financial centres, and of course, things like the oceans, the deserts, the jungles, the mountain ranges, uh, and also, of course, our atmosphere. So when we think about climate change, that's an urban issue, not something that is uh, somehow disconnected from our cities and our city life. Great, hope that stays there. So we look at maps like this. Oh, <laughs> I wonder if it's because I said that. <laughs> so when we look at maps like this, thank you. When we look at, yeah, great. <laughs> uh, it's usually you have a screen here where you can see what's coming forward. But uh, um, So when we look at maps like this, uh, I think that you can see, you know, what it shows us is our, our, our location within a global context, it, you know, pulls in together, you know, everyone in this room and wherever you've come from here and there. This is done in terms of um, uh, economic prosperity as well as population density. As you can see in Australia, we're, we're positioned as being quite an affluent city. But noticeable is, is, the, is the consistency of that spatial settlement pattern that is not, you know, is not homogenous with where it 
with other countries. It's very distinctive to Australia and it's had a particular, traje particular trajectory that we must understand and build from and, and build within. But I guess the danger is, do we get, you know, where do we go with this? Do we, you know, we, we've, we're offered these provocations in the theory, we're, we're in public policy, we're overwhelmed by the complexity, the growing complexity of what our urban areas uh, are offering us. So where can we go with this? Well, what I'd like to close with, and I've been given the two minute um, wind up, is that perhaps what we need to do is come back to some fundamental questions. Maybe we need to come back to some things which, you know, people I think, you know, thought we'd moved on from far away, but actually have some resonance now because in the, the greyness of the complexity, maybe we need to ground ourselves around things that mean something to people. We need to ground ourselves back in place and space. So George Bernard Shaw actually talked about the land question as being a question that, that actually precedes every other question in terms of where we're at. Because what it does is it brings together issues of equality, it brings back issues of justice, it brings back issues of community, it brings back, you know, uh, indigenous cultures which actually don't have a place in our cities as, you know, which developed very much as part of the white settlement um, process. Now this is not uh, thinking about the land question as a two-dimensional deterministic agenda. This is thinking about the land question recast as something that can bring people together around something that they can see, taste and feel. That this is something that acknowledges that we've got food security issues, that acknowledges that there are a range of complex issues going on. And I think if we converge around the land question, rather than a concept such as the city, which as you can see, A, doesn't have a governance structure in Australia, B, um, it doesn't even have defined boundaries, uh, then we might actually uh, get some repurchase on issues that are really crucial uh, within this climate of change. And this is a quote by uh, Frank Stilwell. He's an economist within Australia. I think it's a terrific one. And he raises again, uh, he raised a while ago in 2000, this issue of the land question. He said that land is the most basic aspect of, you know, essentially sustainability, and that the ownership, regulation and use of land has major consequences, and that shaping the spatial form of development, the social distribution of its economic fruits and the quality of the environment are key, really, to understanding uh, what we are. And it helps bridge that divide, which in Australia is quite powerful between what's seen as country folk and city folk. If we converge around land, we're all speaking to the same, to the same tune. And I guess more powerfully, it also links in some of our uh, you know, ancient cultures as well that have been so marginalised and so mistreated uh, within the Australian context. And I just want to uh, read to you some uh, writing by Judith Wright, who's written uh, fairly extensively. And she links land to the dream time as a continuum of past, present and future. That continuum, that nexus, this is where we started this talk, the land question. This is at the heart of what she's saying. So she says that earth, sky, water, tree, spirit, the human complex, in the driest of continents, you know, water, fert, fertility, these are the areas, you know, the lush areas are also the areas where we've built our settlements and we have to better understand that connection. And in the report to the National Estate, even as early as 1974, it commented that the land use patterns in Australia have been radically altered. The rush to cities has produced vast urban conglomerations, uh, we came as exiles, later as predators, and love has come too late, if ever. And how can we shift this connection back to land as a collective, as a community? So in closing, I'll just say that, you know, the, the, the topic I was given for this talk was next cities, future challenges. And I've tried to argue this is at the nexus of past, present and future. And that really we need to return to, I, I argue, the, the land question, but recast, not in the way that it was done 20, 50 years ago, not as an expression of physical determinism, but as a means of connection. And I think this means that, uh, you know, um, agendas such as the lifeboat cities require some friendly scrutiny because the idea of a lifeboat city is one in which we're kind of hermeneutically sealed within something that takes us to another world. But what we need is reconnection with the world that we're in. We, we need to be reconnected back across those borders to see the links, uh, to see the boundaries between how we feed and water ourselves uh, and how we live. We don't want to be disconnected. So we don't want to uh, pursue an agenda that might reinforce alienation and separation from key things uh, such as that. So food security, ecological significance, cultural meaning, public, private, collective, individual, these things congregate around land. Sustainability, climate change and resilience. The 21st century land question can breathe new life into debates 
and help us bring together the different parts of the future cities debate in symposiums such as this. So I'll finish there, thanks. All right, what a wonderful, wonderful note to finish on. Wendy, um, please come back up to the stage and I'll invite Don Miller and Ed. I know there'll be a couple of questions for Wendy, but we're going to ask you to hold them over for a moment while we um, ask our panel to assemble, and also Rod, of course. So we've got Don Miller, the chair of our UPA, Ed Blakely, who you all know, Rod Simpson, associate professor of urban design and famous for his sustainable design at the University of Sydney, and of course, Wendy. Well, thank you. Uh, my major role really is to try to do something of a summary, or at least lead, lead off in developing something of a summary, uh, and obviously this is going to be opinionated, uh, concerning the kinds of topics that we've dealt with over the last several days. Uh, and I wince a bit in uh, trying to follow such a wonderful uh, presentation, which was not only a keynote, but a very deserved or deserving capstone for this, this symposium, so thank you very much. Um, from the perspective of having been around for now 10 of these, uh, there are some differences uh, with what I've observed over the last couple of days uh, that are, I think, remarkable. Uh, one of the differences is the synergy which has resulted from, uh, from not only the kind of program that we've tended to design in the past of several keynotes but, uh, but several uh, uh, track sessions uh, at which people presented papers and, uh, and we normally tried to uh, provide some time for questions and discussion. Uh, but the synergy with, uh, uh, with the round tables that uh, Ed Blakely and the, uh, the the United States uh, Studies uh, Program uh, Center have, uh, have provided here. So, uh, so there is something, a big value added from my point of view uh, in what I've observed over the last several days. Uh, and also uh, topically there are some uh, issues that have, uh, have been much more prominent than they have been in the past. Not that they haven't been mentioned in the past but, or dealt with in the past, but, but they've been prominent predominant in some ways. One of those is the emergent emphasis on governance, which I cherish. Uh, I, I'm not sure that I heard a single presentation, either in the round tables or the plenary sessions or the keynotes or the, uh, uh, the track sessions that didn't somehow address governance. Uh, not government, but governance, uh, which, uh, which I find uh, appropriate and, uh, and very desirable. Uh, also, a greater emphasis on climate change uh, than we've had in previous symposiums. Not that there wasn't some treatment, but, uh, uh, but much more treatment in this context. And of course, uh, partly we, we couch that, uh, couch the, uh, uh, the, the, uh, the framework for this symposium to address that. I'm reminded that Buckminster Fuller said the best way to predict the future is to create it. And I think we've done a fair amount of that. What I'd like to do in the kinds of, of presentations and discussions that we've had, what I'd like to do is to identify a few points that, that I scribbled something about uh, during the sessions that I observed, uh, points that, uh, that help to summarize perhaps uh, this, uh, this event. Uh, and one of those is that uh, planning and its implementation can only be effective if it is inclusive. This was, I think, a theme that I heard repeatedly uh, through the last several days. And another point is that, uh, that it, uh, planning must be responsive to differing cultural and political processes. Uh, and this was, of course, helped by having people from 18 countries participating here. Uh, yet another is that, uh, that planning and environmental management needs to be practical and pragmatic rather than dogmatic, uh, which uh, isn't necessarily a theme that, uh, that crops up in, uh, in professional or academic uh, meetings, but uh, certainly has been prominent in this context, I think. Uh, uh, still another is that traditional approaches to urban planning, uh, both in developed and developing countries, if you wish, uh, have tended to fail to promote equitable, effective, and sustainable urban settlements uh, and have not successfully addressed 21st century challenges 
uh, including aging population, uh, extremely rapid city population increases, uh, in some cases shrinkages, uh, climate change and its effects, urban sprawl, urbanization of poverty, and, uh, uh, and informal uh, settlement patterns. Uh, another issue that, uh, that has been uh, recurrent in, in this uh, series of symposiums uh, is that of uh, uh, the problems of balancing uh, environment and uh, economy and equ equity, the, uh, the three dimensions of uh, sustainable cities, or people, place, and prosperity, as someone stated it. Uh, and as part of that, uh, they, the, the, several of us uh, really did draw attention to the complexity of urban settlement and the problems uh, of urban settlements today. And, and the fact that this, uh, of course, then leads to uncertainty, which is, uh, uh, which is a, 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 an issue that, uh, that the public is uh, painfully aware of. Um, the importance of education of the public uh, a key to behavior change, as someone put it. Uh, I'm reminded of Jean-Jacques Rousseau's comment that the, uh, that the public may be unwise, but they're never wrong. So uh, if that's the case, and to be a little crass, then perhaps the role of, of planners and environmental managers is to wise up the public, that is to provide the kind of intelligence and information in understandable forms uh, that, uh, uh, that will help them be both wise and not wrong. Uh, so uh, a couple of more points uh, very quickly and then turn it over to, uh, to Ed and, and to Rob. Uh, the, the importance of leadership uh, in democratic advocacy, a democratic advocacy of sustainability, of long-term thinking, of long-term planning. Uh, and the centrality of, uh, of economic security uh, as a major public concern, especially now uh, since uh, uh, the great recession, uh, recession that we're in. Uh, and, and finally, uh, the importance of, uh, of governance, which I mentioned earlier, the mix of government, of business, of civil society, of bottom-up participation, uh, for several reasons, aside from it simply being democratic, uh, the business of, uh, of providing legitimacy, providing public education, providing uh, uh, decision makers with local knowledge and preferences, of constituency building, and of uh, uh, improved implementation because of public ownership uh, of, uh, uh, of the decisions themselves. So these are a few of the, uh, of the issues. I, I, I Scribble down some more, but uh, but I won't uh, 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 impose them on you at this point. Uh, and what I hope you will do is to think about the things I missed, which were important to you, and the things that perhaps Ed and Rob uh, will also miss. So, what do you think, Ed? Well, uh, I think the first thing is how privileged we are. Uh, all of us from 18 countries. Uh, who uh, have the opportunity to enter in a discussion like this and listen to speakers like Wendy and, and others. This is a huge privilege and I'm honored to be part of it and to have been with you. Um, one thing I want to say, and I think it's important, is that these rooms, these hallowed halls and so forth, were built for the acquisition of knowledge but also for the dissemination of knowledge. And I think where we have missed the boat, particularly as scholars and many of us policymakers, that we don't spend enough time with the people that we owe this privilege to. That we need to spend more time with the people in the communities, the Aboriginal communities, the other communities, and their knowledge is just as important as ours. It's different, but it's important. And if we are going to help bring about change, we have to be with the people who want, need, and a part of the change structure. Uh, I know a few of you here are practitioners, and many of you have had the opportunity to practice. 
Uh, I just want to give you one little vignette. I had to build a city that was totally destroyed. And I don't mean destroyed in the sense that it was physically destroyed. It was psychologically destroyed. It was socially destroyed. It was organizationally destroyed. Michael Newman saw me in that voyage. The things that we learned as urban planners, the things that the tools that we bring, if we don't have those tools, we can't do that job. But there's always some part of every community that needs to be built, rebuilt, and so on. And as Wendy said, we are facing a future. And we have to have the tools that we're discussing now and move them toward implementation. And every one of us can't just be a thinker. We now have to be an implementer. And if we don't implement, it doesn't matter what we talk about. So I'm urging all of you, not just to put your words in academic journals, but sit down in your own communities, write the op-ed, do the kinds of things, get on the radio, do the kinds of things that help people come to the right place so they make the decisions, because we don't have that power. Rod. Um, well, first, look, I thought that was a, a wonderful end to the whole proceedings. And it um, did make me reflect on a couple of things that you said. And um, it strikes me that the idea of an undifferentiated land and um, undifferentiated cities um, are problematic. And it strikes me that when you bring governance onto land, then you have place. And it strikes me that uh, we are always operating, actually, not just in space, but in place. And this is where the engagement with local communities occurs and where we can see each other face to face and so forth and get beyond theoretical concerns. Um, and, but it occurs to me that, uh, to paraphrase John Mant, who may be in the audience, I've worked with John for many years, and it's, when I say design, um, the issue is not des the physical design, but the, des the design of the invisible structures. Mm. I think if John's here, correct me if I'm wrong, but the design of the invisible structures, I think, is the greatest design challenge. In other words, mm. the design of the governance that's appropriate to the particular situations, not cities in general, not necessarily land in general in an abstract way, but particular places, particular conditions, is the thing that I've got out of this conference. Mm. That, um, I think that we can often be looking overseas for precedence for the easy, you know, the, the silver bullet or the easy answer, and it's never. <laughs> you know, every single place deserves its own set of considerations, and therefore the design of governance. And to, to illustrate what I'm talking about, um, very briefly, uh, we had a great presentation this morning about uh, the politi political dimension of it, with individuals wanting to participate. But those individuals who may have solar panels on their roofs are plugging into a grid. Now, if that's not a perfect example of, on the one hand, you know, we've got a, a society, I think, which is tending towards the atomization of individuals, but within very huge institutions, like Cogent, you know, this is a major big infrastructure provider. That, that separation is actually one of the big challenges, I believe, because we tend to feel comfortable handing things over to big institutions, insurance and all the rest of it, as opposed to that local capacity building. So I think that the, the thing that we might be wanting to combat is atomization on the one hand, as individuals, which is looked after by major institutions. And I think the way to reconcile that is to look at how we operate together in place and design the governance that then allows us to operate in place. So, as an urban designer, I'm, that's the design I'm actually <laughs> principally interested in this. There's the spatial aspects, but the, um, the design of governance appropriate to the situation, to the situation I think, is um, the greatest challenge, which is all, well, John is there. So thank you, John, for that, those words of wisdom from 20 years ago, I think it was. <laughs> but uh, I think they still ring true, obviously. Thank you. Wendy? Chime in. What, what is perhaps the major takeaway for you from this event? 
Um, <clears throat> uh, look, actually, it was. It, I, I can hardly think of another event that I've been to which has brought together people from those different, um, the different stakeholders. I mean, it, 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 maybe I just go to the same academic conferences over and over, but I think there has been some really sincere engagement and conversation between policy makers, between people who have you know, come from different consulting companies from, uh, I was talking to a lady from an NGO yesterday, as well as you know, internationally and nationally. And I think that that, that kind of richness um, certainly helps link back to practice uh, in a much more Way. I think Jenny George, a colleague from, a colleague from Macquarie, talks about pracademics, and I've heard that raised quite a lot. Um, usually it's not discussed at all at conferences, but here it's been celebrated, uh, not, not seen as something um, to be ashamed of. So uh, it's certainly an area that I personally could do, do more in, I think. And so it's given me, so I've been thinking through, uh, and you know, from Ed's call as well, to how, you know, how, how to make those ideas get some traction. Um, yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you. Um, could we have one or two, uh, at least, uh, Comments from the audience in terms of <laughs> what we missed, what your takeaways are that perhaps we didn't touch on? Well, uh, hearing none, uh, let's, uh, let's move on. There's right here. Oh, excuse me. I, I have the light in my eyes, so. Bright orange jumper, though, which helps. <laughs> Sorry, the lights in Go your eyes. Um, I'm Rachel Nesbitt. I am at the city. University of Sydney and I also work at Bankstown City Council and what was really interesting I wouldn't wanted to come here because at the moment we're having trouble just getting people interested in what we actually do at council and why they should comment mm -hmm. and why it's important that they should um, talk about these things and be involved in these things we had six comments on our LEPs and they weren't even formal submissions which was pretty disheartening and it was really interesting to hear what you guys had to say about that but I also wanted to know what, if you had any comments on um, if you've read Bowling Alone by um, Robert Almost Putnam and whether you think that civic participation is actually in decline and while we're pushing for, for more people to engage and for planners to engage people and inform them how that can be done when you know, we can't right. get people to join our Facebook group either. Yeah. <laughs> well, uh, we can have a conference on that. Uh, but, uh, but let me get a quick response from... Well, I, I'd like to, uh, and this is, this, there's no answer that's really satisfactory here in a sense, because um, I remember when I was a very junior academic, uh, I wrote a piece that said people are actively disinterested <laughs> in urban planning. Um, but then I started working in the Yuba cities in various places, and I became struck by the fact that they were interested in their problem. No. They weren't interested in my abstract problem about zoning, but they're interested in their problem. And Portland, I think, is really the example where every Saturday the Portland Oregonian has a, center, a section, a full, the, you know, what do you call it, in the Saturday newspaper, insert. an insert about planning. And every Saturday, uh, the University of Oregon, Oregon State, and Portland State students are in neighborhoods, working with the neighborhoods, talking about planning. Uh, and Chicago does the same thing with the sixth grade curriculum. We need to make what we do accessible, and then people will come to the meetings because they will feel that they have something to say. But our jargon is hard to penetrate. Uh, and we need to start where they are. You know, you'll always, you know, the thing, I think all of us sat down on a plane and the person next to you says, what do you do? And you say, well, I'm an urban planner. <laughs> well, what about that goddamn, sure. you know, fill in the blank? Or we you, need planners. Or, 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 you know, why is the curb too high? Or why haven't you guys fixed up downtown Sydney or Blacktown or whatever? Say, well, why don't you come to the meetings? Oh, who in the hell wants to do that? <laughs> Let's get a quick response so. from you, Ron. Uh, I think subsidiarity is a, uh, a key principle, perhaps. Um, because, I mean, I think it has a twofold aspect. On the one hand, it has responsibility, but it also infers authority, and it's operating at a level which is appropriate. And I think that's, um, you know, so when we talk about metropolitan governance, for example, um, that has to cascade down into right, the very localised issues. Yeah. And 
if we're talking about the sense of community, that, that true sense of community might really only exist within a, a few hundred households where there might be a preschool that's that, mm. that nexus, and yet we might also want to be able to be engaged in, in the competitiveness of a, a city. Sure. And so the governance and the, 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 that principle of subsidiarity, which of course was what Federation was all about, <laughs> you know, um, uh, is something that I think we need to also actively look at. Uh, and I think that you know, the United States, as I understand it, has a, a much more uh, nuanced uh, set of levers and governance structures and uh, ability to actually look at the taxation regimes. And, and this is what I mean by designing the system. Like who's responsible for what, where, who pays, who benefits, to have the flexibility to actually engage people in a real way that affects their lives, obviously has a spatial Mm -hmm. dimension and spatial aspect. So I'm, that's, yep. I don't know whether that makes any sort of sense. <laughs> well, and, and one of the reasons why I deferred to the others is I come from Seattle, and we have something called the Seattle process, uh, which is uh, just a term for everyone wants to be involved. It's all the way back to Alexis de Tocqueville. Everyone wants to have standing. Uh, and a, con a consequence is that decisions take an awful long time to to finalize. Uh, but I think it's probably cultural. I don't know. I, it's not necessarily because we're so good as planners there. I have a note here uh, from, uh, from Nicole that says, Don, can, can you wrap up now? Uh, <laughs> and, uh, and, yeah. and I think it, uh, you know, it, it, it's a nice, uh, what, sorry. Would you mind if I just quickly responded to that question as oh, well? Oh, please. Thanks. <laughs> um, thanks. A, a lovely question and, and well articulated. But uh, I mean, I think we see people, people do respond when they're passionate about something. We saw thousands of people go to the street about climate change in every you know, city in Australia. Um, in Queensland, we saw a, a big dam water grid project um, knocked on the head because you know, um, people in a regional context said, no, actually, we think urban you know, people in the big cities need to do more in terms of their own. Uh, you know, so I mean, I think that there are lots of examples of where people do get motivated and they do act on issues that they feel you know close to the heart but I think where where your challenge is is that for that you know and I think you were mentioning this as well it's that it's that it's the the fine grain the long term the slow tick the not so sexy um, you know but but really still really important decisions how do you get people involved in that kind of shaping rather than the hot button issues that, you know, that we see in politics make people lurch quickly from sort of knee-jerk, you know, um, that, so I think that it's a complex one in that regard, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Well, uh, we do have a bit of a time management issue here, and, uh, uh, and Nicole, among other things, uh, wants to do some thank yous, but I, uh, she's not going to thank herself. Uh, the point that I'm making is that, uh, uh, that I'd like to thank uh, the, the core of the organ organizing group here, the host group, and that's Nicole Kidman. Uh, Peter Phibbs. Oh, Kidman. Uh, uh, Nicole Kidman. Girl. That, what a slip. Nicole Kidman. I what wish a slip. Nicole Kidman were here. I mean. Well, uh, you know, take it as uh, for whatever it is. Uh, Nicole Garan, uh, Peter Phibbs, uh, and Susan Thompson, and, uh, and their respective uh, programs. So please. I have to say, thank you very much. I'm Susan Thompson. Nicole Garan has done the heavy lifting on this Congress symposium, and I just really want to say thank you to Nicole um, in, Kidman, in that spirit. But, but it was our pleasure to be supportive of Nicole, and I think it's been testament to her fantastic work that we've had such a wonderful meeting. And it's not finished yet because we've got the evening event. Sure. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. I'm instructed to release you back. <laughs> Good. Yes, that's right. I'm Nicole Kidman. <laughs> And I'm not going to keep you for long because it's freezing here and we're about to warm you up with a very, very fast walk over to the Seymour Centre where there's going to be some warming refreshments. But I do have to say a couple of housekeeping things so that we don't lose you before the event is over. And of course, I do need to thank, 
to thank some people, but I'll do it quickly. But the main reason that we need you to stay till the very end is because we want to tell you the secret of where UPE 11 is going to be held. And we want to see you there, of course. Okay. So study tours, the most important thing. If you're coming on a study tour tomorrow, and we hope you are, it's not too late. Tell me if you're not booked. But we want you out the front of the main quadrangle, ready to catch a bus, 8.30 if you're going to the Blue Mountains. You know, don't be there at 8.31, the bus may have gone. So be there on time, 8.30 for the Blue Mountains tour, 9 o'clock for all of the other tours. So a bus will be there to pick you up. Please join us. Um, Tonight, as soon as we leave here, we're all going to walk down together. Those of us, those of you who can join us, I know some people have to fly home, but the rest of you, we're going to walk along a very historic route across the university, across the um, old Victoria Park, and you'll look up and you'll see the Seymour Centre, which is where we're going to gather for a couple of um, book launches and then, of course, a public talk. And there's a lot of people from the city coming to join us, so I hope you can as well. So before I hand over to Professor George Carroll, are you here, George? I can't see you. Wave. Yes, you're there. Okay, great. So before I hand over to George, let me say thank you. On behalf of myself, Susan and Peter, who are absolutely fantastic chairs, I bet you want to know if there was a backstory to organising this symposium. There are no arguments, not between us and not between my fabulous co-hosts, the United States Study Centre. In fact, it was a fantastic, um, it was a fantastic relationship. I need to say thank you to Don, who was an incredibly um, generous and supportive um, chair of IUPIA, and of course the rest of the IUPIA board, and particularly those of you who could join us. Um, we really appreciated that. Um, our local organising committee, of course, Adrian Keane, thank you so much if you're still here in the room, Amit, Batarai, particularly Ruse Bay, the two of them, absolute technical geniuses, made sure that all of the parallel um, sessions managed to work. And Adrian, of course, with the PhD colloquium and um, tomorrow's study tour. Our local advisory committee, Liam from the Depa Department of Planning, Monica Peroni from the City of Sydney, Catherine Labati also from the State Government, the Major Cities Unit, I mean, you've all been tremendous um, support to us, Dorte, of course, and your team. And Sarah Hill, who's over at the Olympics now, so we'll have to forgive her, but um, President of New South Wales Planning Institute was behind us every step of the way as well. Um, Paul McGinn, Barb on our um, advisory panel, thank you so much for your support. Ed, Rob Hill, Tara, Melissa, Susan from the United States Study Centre, Anne-Marie, Elsa and Catherine from my own faculty. And of course our marvellous volunteers, thank you. Can everyone thank our volunteers? And Patty, Alison and Rachel for holding up the fort from um, ICMS, um, please accept our special thanks. And of course, I don't know if Sandy Burjoin is still here, but she has been the most amazing co-host. Anyone who's had the most amazing um, organiser with me, anyone who's had any of their arrangements organised by Sandy will know what she's done behind the scenes. She's been absolutely brilliant, particularly in organising the roundtable sessions and the keynote sessions, as well as the overall program. So thank you so much, Sandy. You've been wonderful. So now, can I call to the stage, Don, Don, you have the um, special flag. And we're about to hand it over to, and apologies for my pronunciation, I'm not going to even try. Um, George has said I'm allowed to call him George, but he will, he will say his name and he will tell you where UPE 11 is going to be in 2014. Good evening, thank you very much. My name is Jorge Carol, quite alike to George. And I am at the uh, School of Architecture and Planning at the Universidad Nacional de la Plata in Argentina. The secret, so to say, is that UP11 will take place in Latin America. And this is the first time UP uh, makes a meeting in Latin America and uh, we are very, proud and uh, to, to, to have this opportunity. As a matter of fact, 
um, uh, our continent is uh, different, diverse, and yet it has a lot of uh, common features. Probably the two or three I would like to mention today is political discontinuities, economical discontinuities, a great uh, importance of landowners in the historical evolution of the continent, a great amount of poor people, and a very acute inequality uh, in all our countries. Based on these differences, personally, I thought that we did have uh, acute differences with planning uh, knowledge, planning practices, etc., in so-called central countries. After the meeting of these last days, I'm not very sure how different we are and how so much common things and questions we, we have to share. Be it as it may, uh, the idea is that we at the uh, School of Architecture and Planning at the Universidad Nacional de La Plata have the idea of inviting not only you, but also all our respected colleagues working in urban planning in all Latin America, since Mexico downwards to Argentina and Chile, who are at, at, at the southern part. And we hope we have the chance to not uh, approach issues, but rather formulate questions. And this is what we will be working with uh, UPA in the, the next two years in preparation of this. We are um, eager to receive you and, and our colleagues of, of Latin America and have very good debates and have uh, great discussions with you. So uh, you will be welcome in two years' time in the city of La Plata. Welcome. Uh, this is definitely not the Olympics, but we do have a little bit of a ceremony, and that's a flag that uh, has been passed from, uh, from host to host uh, for the last uh, at least decade. Uh, La Plata, by the way, is, uh, is essentially uh, a satellite of Buenos Aires, so uh, there's the opportunity to learn to tango and a few other things. Uh, uh, it, uh, it's a very promising prospect uh, to be there. So, uh, we now pass the flag. Yeah, wow. Yeah, wow. <laughs> is this the right thing up? Uh, this is it. Okay, there's no the other way around. There we go. Thank you. 